welcome to the Alex Salmon Show, where the great game of Brexit is now well into overtime. Alex is back in Belfast, climaxing our series on the impact of the Brexit debate on Northern Irish politics and indeed how Ireland has determined the end game of Brexit. This week he speaks to the doyen of Ulster political commentators Eamon Malley, who has some vigorous criticism of the political leadership of the province, DUP, Sinn Féin and Northern Ireland's Tory Secretary of State. The Democratic Unionist Party are putting their sense of unionism, their sense of the union, ahead of the economic well-being of the people of Northern Ireland. Mary Lou MacDonald's taken over the Sinn Féin party recently as president. She's made several major mistakes. We have a Secretary of State who is deemed right across the community in terms of Karen Bradley by nationalists and by unionists to be, see, uh, to be a lame duck Secretary of State, really unfamiliar with the workings of this place. Here at Westminster, the Prime Minister is also under heavy fire from commentators and just about everybody else. On this show, one of our previously strongest defenders caused a stir this week when he recanted on his support for Brexit. I think it's important just to use the fact that two and a half years have passed to assess it. And you can see that there are real problems of the idea and things which are really kind of worrying. And I say this as a Brexiteer, I went through a real dark night of the soul about this. Theresa May told us her government would deliver on Brexit on March 29th. She told us that there was only one deal on the table. She told us there would be no European elections. And yet over the last week, Theresa May's ministers have been closeted away with Her Majesty's opposition, deciding which of her remaining red lines to erase. Now she's back in Brussels, begging for their further stay of execution from Europe. The reprieve is on offer, but everything has its price. We would not discuss anything with the UK until there is an agreement for Ireland and Northern Ireland, as well as for citizens' rights and the financial settlement. The EU will stand fully behind Ireland. Now, all of this has left even the most faithful of Tories somewhat nonplussed. I spoke to columnist Peter Oborn, who says it's time for fellow Brexiteers to wake up, smell le fromage and think again. Welcome to the show, Peter Oborn. Now, you've caused quite a stir over the past few days by your recanting on your support for Brexit. Is it the idea uh, of Brexit that's flawed or is it the Prime Minister's attempts uh, to try and make it happen uh, that's the issue? Well, I think the Prime Minister has done her best, actually. I really admire the way uh, Mrs May has really struggled in face of all kinds of humiliations and setbacks uh, to make Brexit happen according to her, her vision of it. But she, her vision has been defeated. And in the light of that, I think it's important just to use the fact that two and a half years have passed to assess it. And you can see that there are real problems of the idea and things which are really kind of worrying. And I say this as a Brexiteer, I went through a real dark night of the soul about this. Mm -hmm. But you can see the economic consequences um, in this country as being, I think the economic model has collapsed. It's important to say that. Was there any particular, you talk about you went through a dark night, was there any particular thing that happened? What issue was it that made you realise that I need to rethink my, my views on this? Well, there were several issues. The first one, I think, was the, was the economics. When, and there was one particular symbolic moment when Sir James Dyson, who's a great industrialist, mm -hmm. Um, and he'd been a great campaigner for Brexit, and he um, uh, and he made he said it would work. Brexit would work economically. When he took his businesses, his HQ, and took them to Singapore, the, you know, he was the poster boy of Brexit. And suddenly he, he's going abroad. And the same thing happened. Uh, didn't matter so much, but with Jim Ratcliffe, the great chemicals manufacturer. And when you see these manufacturers who said Britain is going to be okay. Uh, outside the European Union and when they take their businesses overseas uh, before that I felt that for me that hit me in the stomach and the other one is uh, unlike uh, Alex Salmons but I am a great I'm a great admirer of Alex but I'm a unionist I really believe in the U United Kingdom and when it hit me that I think in due course Brexit puts the whole United Kingdom in jeopardy that also really hurt me I think, and this is culpable, but I wasn't alone, 
you know, not understanding the 500 years of Irish history and how that has come back to haunt. I think the Secretary of State had a bit of issue with that as well, did she not? And I think the Prime Minister, actually, I've been told by Dining Street sources, actually, how the Prime Minister was really hurt when she went to Northern Ireland three, three months ago and realised what, what Brexit was doing. And in terms of these so-called Dining Street talks, are they taking us any further forward? Or is it just perhaps something to let the, the other EU27 know that behind the scenes work is still going on, still trying to reach some agreement to enable an extension to be granted? Well, I think it's more than that. I do think Mrs May has made a very profound decision. Until 10 days ago, she was trying to have Brexit on Tory party terms. She was trying to win over the support of the Eurosceptics knowing that if she can't take the Tory party in a united way to Brexit, it's going to cause this enormous cleavage. She tried and she failed. So now she's appealing to Labour. There are all kinds of reasons why the Labour Party support might not come, but I think it's very serious. And she's trying to get a united national vision of Brexit. There's been no sign yet, as far as I can see, that that's working, but I don't know. No, I do believe it's serious. But it must say that she's now been talking for a week and nothing has come out of it. Do you think Brexit's going to happen, Peter? I think there's going to be a delay. Uh, and I think that's, it's very important what's going to happen in the next 48 hours. It looks to me like Britain is going to have to accept a pause. I think that's the best thing. I went into the House of Commons uh, the night before last. Mm -hmm. And you meet these MPs. They're shattered. Uh, they're tormented. I want, they want to do the right thing, but they've got their constituents, they've got their party members, they've got the whip's office. These are people, and I had, talking privately to them, I realised the agony of the soul that they've been going through. And I've gone through the same agony of the soul. It's a very serious matter. And of course, serious for the Conservative Party itself. Do you think Brexit will lead to the eventual breakup of the, the Conservative Party and Jeremy Corbyn then in number 10? I certainly think that if Mrs May accepts this long pause which is being talked about as we speak, there will be an eruption within the Conservative Party. Um, we've been, theoretically, the party ought to split, really, because it does have two different visions of the world. Will that put Corbyn in number 10? Maybe, but remember, the Labour Party is equally split. And so we are entering very, very, very turbulent transformative moment in British politics. We are indeed. Peter Warren, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Our series on Northern Ireland has excited considerable comment and this is what you've had to say. Scotia says, wonderful series of shows from Ulster Alex. So interesting to hear such engaged and informative people dealing with the shambles of a Westminster imposed Brexit. All power to our Irish cousins north and south. Jane says, referring to something that was said on our show last week in relation to Jacob Rees-Mogg says, People look at him and just feel that the far right has gone too far. Quite, says Jane. But the fact the far of the right got so much power in the first place is an issue we need to confront and understand. Sam says, It amazes me how anti-democratic these MPs become if the people don't toe the party line. I've never heard them complain about their votes when elected when it suited them. Thanks for that, Sam. Pilar says, I find this interview with John Sheridan very informative and also very important. Great show. Thank you, Pilar. Gabriel says, we did not vote to have a people's vote in Scotland. We voted to stay in the EU in an independent Scotland. And Gavin says, the UK MPs have never articulated the impact of Brexit. Many non-happy chappies there. Now to conclude our series on Northern Ireland, let us join Alex in Belfast. Those who believe that 20 years of peace brought an end to community divisions should take a walk to East Belfast in the shadow of the cranes of Harland and Wolfe. Here you'll find murals from either side painted on just about every wall. You'll find memorials to the paramilitaries who died during the conflict. You'll find communities separated by peace walls, one enclave on another on a smaller enclave. This is the reality, that divisions are not ended by a peace process. It takes time. But the real divisions are not the physical ones and barriers of peace walls. They're the ones that exist in people's minds. No political commentator has followed the last turbulent decades of Northern Irish politics more closely than Doyen of political correspondents Eamon Malley. He has interviewed everyone who has been influential in the politics of the province. Eamon, welcome to the Alex Salmon Show. Thank you very much, Alex. Thanks for Eamon, having me. 
I mean, people have invested a lot in power sharing in, in Northern Ireland. You're quite pessimistic that there'll be a return to power sharing. Why, why is that? As a parent, as a grandfather, I'm very grateful for the fact that the, the violence has gone away. I lived through all those dark, dark day, days. The bottom line is trust has vaporized, etherized in our community between the Catholic community, uh, the nationalist community, and the Democratic Unionist Party. Broadly speaking, that trust has gone. And the message from within broad nationalism, middle class and working class is, have nothing more to do with the Democratic Unionist Party in a power sharing executive. See, the conventional wisdom that, at least medium term, that the peace process depended on power sharing, but you don't see it that way. That was the engine of peace in Northern Ireland, power sharing. But there's a sense that nationalism has been so burnt within its experience, whereby you had a unionism dedicated on an ongoing basis to thwarting so-called parity of esteem, a sense of Irishness of those who are not unionists per se. That's why we're in deadlock now. Now, obviously, when there was <coughs> the power sharing as personified by Ian Paisley as the first minister and Democratic Unionist uh, leader, Martin McGuinness as deputy first minister uh, and leading member of Sinn Féin. Do you see MD within these two parties with the imagination required to, to make that partnership, type of partnership work? Sadly not. What those two men did, coming from very, very different backgrounds, Martin McGuinness, a, a confessed IRA man, Ian Paisley, uh, strong evangelist, anti-Republican, anti-United Ireland. They found generosity within their hearts with advancing years. I do not see anybody with that capacity to lead in republicanism or in unionism today. And now we have a situation where the, the democratic unionists, the, the party Paisley created, dominates unionism. Sinn Féin now dominates uh, Irish nationalism in the north. Uh, is there any prospect of uh, uh, another force emerging which can, can, can bind the political arrangements together? There is nobody within the island or within these islands, as far as I can see, with the capacity to undo the damage that has been done. We need another George Mitchell-style chairperson, independently informed, to come in here and to undo what went before and start building afresh. And I doubt, unless there's a reconfiguration within the Democratic Unionist Party in terms of leadership and senior personnel, I doubt if there's a capacity for nationalism to go back into government with that particular party. But talking about George Mitchell, you interviewed him along with the, all the other major personae over the last generation. Did any of the, the people who came in to help, whether it be Bill Clinton or George Mitchell, did any of them really understand Northern Ireland? I think that uh, George Mitchell was the most consummate politician I've ever met. He had a very, very good brain and he had a very good manner, a manner in terms of management of people of differing persuasions. We need somebody like that, somebody with that vast experience uh, to take control again. Join us after the break where Alex continues his interview with journalist Eamon Malley. We'll see you then. Welcome back. Northern Ireland's most experienced political commentator is Eamon Malley. Let's rejoin his interview with Alex in Belfast. Talk to me about Brexit. Uh, I mean, I know you've been chairing symposium uh, uh, across, the, across the province so discussing Northern Ireland's position within Europe, if there is one. How is that affecting the political discourse? We're obsessing with Brexit here. And uh, certainly, short of a resolution of Brexit, there is no hope of uh, the British government becoming seriously engaged in talks in terms of restoring devolution, our own administration in Northern Ireland. The government realises that. They haven't got the resources, they haven't got the energy nor the time to dedicate 
to uh, attempting even to restore power devolution in Northern Ireland. We have a Secretary of State who is deemed right across the community in terms of Karen Bradley by nationalists and by unionists to be, see, uh, to be a lame duck Secretary of State, really unfamiliar with the workings of this place. So I wouldn't be hopeful in the context of the unresolved Brexit that we're going to move forward politically here. Let's talk about this political structure and see how uh, firmly based it is. I mean, the Democrat Unionist Party, by virtually every account and observer dominating uh, politics at Westminster in a way that uh, probably hasn't been done since, I don't know, Edward Carson, uh, and yet uh, may be causing strains among their voting base. So they have this strong position in the Westminster Parliament, extracting a, a high price for their votes on, on Brexit, and yet some murmurings among the business community, the farming community, that perhaps the DUP and their strength are not operating in Northern Irish interests. I would genuinely be concerned about the attitude and mood within loyalism. And I think we want to be very careful not to do anything here collectively in terms of our actions and use of language, which might motivate or provoke people to bring guns back onto the street. Which brings us to the, the Sinn Féin position, achieved dominance in the nationalist community, uh, a deal of respectability in terms of the separation of the, of the ballot box from the, from the bullet in a way that you know, hadn't been done before, uh, and yet agitating for a, a border poll. Uh, is that the, uh, the sort of move that's necessary for their own supporters, but is going to keep uh, the uh, unionist community in its lager? Mary Lou MacDonald's taken over the Sinn Féin party recently as president. She's made several major mistakes. To be seen walking the streets of New York behind a banner with the slogan, England, get out of Ireland. A banner from 100 years ago. An anachronism of this day. Rightly so, the Irish Foreign Minister Simon Coveney said, you don't represent modern Ireland speaking like that. The Republic of Ireland is a sophisticated European country now, on the world stage. And then you're faced with that hubris, that insularity from Mary Lou Macdonald. And yet the first Sinn Féin leader for 100 years, uh, well, the first Sinn Féin leader ever, actually, who could legitimately came to have a separation uh, through her career from, uh, from the violent struggle. And thus to be admired. But that's where leadership arises. You've got to rise above that and maximize that. Now, she will learn, but it might be too late. It might be too late already. Now, she's a bright lady, Trinity College graduate like myself, capable, postgraduate. She's all the resources within her. Judgment is where it comes. And if the judgment is absence, I'm not giving up on her, but she needs a lot of counseling and good voice, advice and a lot of grey hair around her. I think that the best brains in Dublin civil service and in the civil service in, in London should be putting their heads together at this, at this very moment, pre-planning for the changing demographics and emerging situation in Northern Ireland to obviate a situation down the road where we will have a rerun of 1912, where we will, we will have loyalists or the emergence of a Carson-type figure seeking to import arms into Northern Ireland to become involved in an uprising. We should obviate that situation. And that's why change here has to be handled, in my opinion, so carefully, so meticulously, cognizant of the sensitivities of both communities. I would be more concerned about the Protestant unionist community, the loyalist community, rather than the Republican community. I think there's a greater sense of confidence within Republican nationalism than obtains within loyalism. And currently, the Democratic Unionist Party are putting their sense of unionism, their sense of the union, ahead of the economic well-being of the people of Northern Ireland. The deal promoted by Theresa May after her trip to Europe and coming back home was a crock of gold at the end of the rainbow for people in Northern Ireland. 
we would have benefited immensely from that deal because we would have been within the customs union and would have continued as part of the EU. And I could envisage against that backdrop that we could have easily attracted Facebook, uh, Twitter, Intel, all of these big multinational national companies into places like West Belfast, into Protestant Catholic areas. We have a good uh, learned workforce here, most of which are, are leaving here. My son's generation uh, went to state schools, grammar schools, hemorrhaged from this place. We are losing, we are losing these young people nonstop for 35 years. We have to get a remedy to bring those people back home and to stop the ongoing hemorrhaging from here. What does it do to opinion in Northern Ireland when we look at Westminster politics and see a, a government in chaos and confusion and, and a prime minister and the leadership apparently not knowing what their next step is, and indeed a Secretary of State for Northern Ireland who's at best uncertain about Irish history. Northern Ireland voted to remain in Europe. We have a, a lady who calls herself First Minister, a woman who is careless with her use of language, refers to human beings as crocodiles. Two words in my generation have changed the course of history in Northern Ireland. Crocodile, and Brexit. Crocodile, a word which fell from the lips of Arlene Foster, the former First Minister of Northern Ireland, who branded those who were aspiring to have an Irish language act here, like your Scottish Gaelic Act. She branded the aspirants of that act, those who espoused that act, as crocodiles. And she said, feed a crocodile and it'll keep coming back for more. That has irretrievably, incontrovertibly changed the psyche of nationalism, that remark. That has done more damage than any utterance or any act or behavior of unionism historically. Secondly, Brexit has compounded the difficulties here. It has driven the communities apart. The Catholic nationalist community, very sympathetic to remaining in Europe. Northern Ireland has done well out of Europe. The infrastructure which obtains peace money, all of that. Farmers are saying, where are we going to get our money if Europe leaves? Headage fees flowing in here from Europe nonstop. Who's going to provide the headage fees if we leave Europe? So we're in turmoil here. Uh, turmoil, we have a leadership of Westminster which is inexplicably dislocated from its, uh, from its base. Now, but if you had to judge, given political leadership given events, given the changes that are taking place, when uh, is that likely to be? Or do you argue that what will happen is you may arrive at a United Ireland almost by osmosis as opposed to by a single event? If that were to happen, it should happen organically. I come from a background which holds to this view. No injustice, real or perceived, merited one life being taken, period. I'm a father, a husband, a grandfather, and a citizen. And we all have a responsibility to act with dignity and be concerned about our brother, whether it's Protestant or whatever. Where are we constitutionally? Is there similarities between the run-up to the, uh, the Irish Revolution? Are we at a point which, where things could move either way, depending on decisions that are made? Where would you say we are in terms of... Uh, uh, his history coming round again. I am of the opinion that there is uh, sufficient confidence within the broad nationalist republican community that they will not revert to any manifestation of violence. They can read the tea leaves, they, they can see the way the wind is blowing, they can, they can read the demographics. The downside of that is that the Protestant Unionist community, it continues to see its decline numerically. Uh, the best brains have left Northern Ireland. They're in Dubai, they're in Scotland, they're in uh, London. And that generation, they just don't want to be identified with the vulgarity of much of unionism. So that's the reason why 
I am concerned about the young Protestant loyalist who feels left behind, who doesn't really see much to which to aspire. I am concerned about that young impatient individual who might ill-advisedly recourse to the use of arms. That's why we've got to be so careful with our use of language here. Eamon, thank you very much. Now, I can't forecast when and if there'll be a United Ireland, but what I can do is present you with the Alex Salmon Quay. Now, you know the trail. Right, how far? Whiskey. Only Whiskey better. Sco <laughs> it's the Quay. Only Scotch. None of that uh, Bushmill stuff. It, nah, burn, it burns a hole nah, in nah, the in, Alex. <laughs> nah, well, thank Stand you so you. much, Eamon. Go to my yogurt. Go to my yogurt. Excellent. <laughs> Leva. Leva. The whole map of Europe has been changed, but as the deluge subsides and the waters fall short, we see the dreary steeples of Fermanagh and Tyrone emerging once again. That was Winston Churchill's weary quote from 1922. He was hardly a disinterested party, and he was about to lose his parliamentary seat in Dundee, largely because he was no longer regarded as a trusted friend of Ireland. Theresa May should have taken careful note at the outside of this Brexit burach. She was, after all, one of the few UK politicians to actually campaign in Ireland during the 2016 referendum. However, she didn't, and the rest is to make history. In Northern Ireland, as we have seen during this series, the nature of the Brexit debate itself has accelerated forces of social and economic change, which will likely bring the Prime Minister's precious union into question much earlier than would otherwise have been the case. Meanwhile, the, the Irish Republic finds solace in the, the solidarity of its European partners. They are trusted friends of Ireland, as Monsieur Barney made clear in Dublin this week. Even the aftermath of a no-deal Brexit would only be negotiated with Ireland's interests in mind. However, the likelihood is that the Prime Minister will grasp the political humiliation of the, a long Brexit extension rather than the economic dislocation of a hard Brexit. In the 600 years of uneven relationship between these two islands, few would have ever thought to witness Dublin pleading with the continental powers for them to be generous to London government and to grant the time necessary to save England from its own folly. If Lord Cornwallis, who became Lord Lieutenant of Ireland after he surrendered to the Americans at Yorktown, if he were still around, he might well have his regimental band play an encore of the world turned upside down. It is an irony which will be appreciated by students of history. For some it will be grief, for many a relief, but it will be the political end of this Prime Minister. And now from Tasmina and me and all at the show, it's goodbye for now.